I'm going to talk to you about why time is difficult to handle in programming, why it's a, such a source of bugs. Uh, and I'm not going to show you any code, I'm just going to give you uh, a couple of clues at the end as to what you can do to avoid bugs. The basic reason why time is difficult is that there's more than one thing that we call time. And we've only relatively recently learned this, so we haven't quite caught on with the ramification of it yet. Like relatively recently, I mean the 1890s. Um, up until the 1890s, the, the most stable oscillator anyone knew about was the rotating Earth. Uh, in 1884, the International Meridian Conference chose the Greenwich Meridian to be the International Prime Meridian, and so mean solar time on the Greenwich Meridian, which is to say Greenwich Mean Time, became the international standard time scale. Uh, actually, since then, it's it's been renamed. Uh, in 1928, uh, it, it, it was proposed that it should instead be called universal time for two reasons. Firstly, because it, it's parochial, and secondly, because there was a technical ambiguity in the definition of Greenwich Mean Time. So, so the name GMT is now deprecated. Uh, you know, these deprecations always take a while to catch on. Uh, anyway, um, the, so the way things changed in the 1890s was the, the astronomer Simon Newcomb wanted to improve the tables of, of ephemerides that, that predict the, the visible locations of the, of the planets and the moon. And uh, he, he, did, he worked very diligently. He, he looked at a huge swathe of, of, of observations dating from about 1750 to 1890. And uh, he, he devised a very precise uh, mathematical theory of the motion of the planets, particularly the inner planets uh, and of the moon. Uh, and, of course, it didn't match up perfectly with the observations. Uh, it, 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 you could never get it to match perfectly. But uh, he found that some of the disagreements he, he couldn't put down to any flaw in the theory. And he reckoned that what was wrong was the time scale he was using. He, he reckoned that he could see uh, non-linearities in universal time. Uh, on a time scale of, of decades, he, he thought the uh, rate of rotation of the Earth was changing slightly. That was quite a radical idea at the time. We now know he was spot on. Um, he was, in fact, the first person in history to have access to a clock that's more stable than the Earth. Uh, unfortunately, his clock was the solar system, uh, and in particular the Moon. So it, it's not a very accessible clock. You can't, you can't really refer to it minute to minute. Uh, to, to make use of this as a clock, you'd have to make very precise astronomical observations over quite a long period of time. Um, it's, it's very awkward. So, so that remained a, mostly a curiosity for the next few decades. It wasn't until the 1940s that people started actually using it as a clock. Uh, as astronomers who found universal time uh, by this point inadequate uh, started actually uh, using the solar system as a clock. And they did this by working Newcomb's theory backwards. That they, they would observe the positions of, of the planets, actually mostly of the moon. And they, they would work at, they would look up in Newcomb's theory when the planets ought to have been in that position. And they said, that's the time for, for the purposes of this time scale. Uh, of course, that, that's not universal time. They, they called it ephemeris time because it's based on the theory of ephemerides. Um, and uh, this was standardized in, in 1952. Uh, and of, of course, because Newcomb had had been working on the basis that universal time was the correct time scale to use, though it was perfectly uniform, uh, the, the time coordinate in Newcomb's theory is described in terms of days, hours, minutes, and seconds. And so when you work that backwards to get ephemeris time, you find ephemeris time labels times in the form of days, hours, minutes, and seconds, even though it's now got nothing to do with the rotation of the Earth. There is no cycle that corresponds to the day of ephemeris time. Okay, so, uh, so that's Ferris Lamb, which is now really just a historical curiosity, but it, it was it, it's conceptually important. Uh, we're more interested in artificial clocks. The first artificial clocks to perform better than the rotating Earth uh, were, were electromechanical pendulum clocks, starting in 1921. Uh, and these achieved the uh, remarkable accuracy of one millisecond per day, which is slightly more stable than the rotating Earth, and these clocks were enough to spot some periodic seasonal variations in the rotation rate of the Earth. Uh, and then, of course, we've got uh, um, 
uh, quartz clocks, uh, that was 1927, uh, and they, they could do a slightly finer job. Uh, and matters really came to a head with, with the invention of atomic clocks. Uh, the theory had been around for decades, but the first useful one was built in 1955. Uh, so, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the atomic clock, this was not only uh, more stable than the rotating Earth, but it was, it was actually stable enough to be useful as a, a, a real-time realization of the ephemeris time. Uh, and astronomers used it that way. It, it, looking at an atomic clock is a lot more convenient than uh, performing the, these observations of the moon. Uh, but in, in fact, they, they recognized it was actually more stable than ephemeris time. And so, pretty quickly, people wanted to define uh, a, a new time scale in purely in atomic terms. So, they spent three years making precise astronomical observations of the kind required for ephemeris time and timing them with atomic clocks. They, they did this work from, from 1955 to early 1958. And then, as often happens in metrology, they ran that theory backwards. And having measured the, the frequency of the microwave uh, radiation inside the atomic clock, they defined the atomic second as so many periods of that radiation. So, so far we've had three definitions of the second. We've had the second of universal time, of ephemeris time, and of atomic time. And eventually the uh, German Conference on Weights and Measures caught up with these, but the, the, they always run on a lag. So here are the standard definitions of the second. Uh, in the 19th century, the uh, General Conference on Weights and Measures didn't actually formally define the second. They just tacitly accepted the traditional definition. Then in 1960, even though the, the atomic second had already been defined in 1958, uh, this is the point at which they adopted the ephemeris second. And then in 1967, finally, they, they adopted the atomic second. Uh, and that definition was, was refined 30 years later. That if you're building an atomic clock, you now have to correct for the temperature of the components. Uh, so uh, we've, got the, we've got the atomic second. That, that's half the story for uh, creating an, an atomic time scale. The other half is labeling points in time uh, and synchronizing it. Uh, so, uh, and as ephemeris, had done, ephemeris time had done by accident, with atomic time they deliberately used the traditional uh, notation of days, hours, minutes, and seconds, even though, once again, there is no cycle corresponding to the day here. Uh, and they, they synchronized retrospectively by defining that, that uh, atomic time had been synchronized with universal time at the beginning of 1958. That's retrospective because the atomic second hadn't been defined then. Uh, and the, uh, because atomic clocks had been operating continuously since 1955, you can actually retrospectively apply the definition of the atomic second back to earlier times. And so uh, the, the atomic time scales uh, act, act effectively stretch all the way back to 1955. Um, now, there were initially about half a dozen national laboratories uh, contributing to this, running atomic clocks, and uh, they, they very early on recognized that they would get a better clock by averaging what all of their clocks were doing than, than by running a, a single clock. So, um, not only did they synchronize with the universal time, more importantly, and more precisely, they synchronized with each other. And this averaging process continues today. Uh, there, are, there are now about 70 laboratories worldwide that run atomic clocks that contribute to what we now call International Atomic Time, TAI. Uh, that, it's been named TAI since, uh, since 1971. Uh, so that's, that's atomic timekeeping. Uh, and I need to talk about uh, time signals. Radio time signals started in 1905. And of course they used the best technology at the time, which was pure mechanical pendulum clocks. They, were, they had a, an accuracy of about 10 milliseconds per day. So they had to continuously adjust them to keep uh, them synchronized with universal time. Uh, of course they then adopted better technology as it become, became available. Uh, by the time they got to using atomic clocks, initially the US National Bureau of Standards in 1956, they couldn't synchronize it the same way as they had before. Uh, and the practicalities were all different. And, and the, the National Bureau of Standards chose uh, quite a controversial idea at the time, that having initially set, um, set their signals going at, 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 at an appropriate rate, matching universal time, backed by the atomic clock, 
they didn't adjust this frequency. They let they, they, they kept running at the same frequency and let it drift away from the universal time. And when it got, when it got far enough away to notice, they um, uh, they jumped the time by 20 milliseconds, and, and then they they jumped it again when when it had drifted further again, uh, and, and they, they performed many of these small jumps, uh, and, and less frequently they changed the frequency to match the new rate of, of universal time. Um, now, although that was initially controversial, uh, other other time bureaus quickly recognised the practicality of it and decided they ought to do the same sort of thing. So, for a while. All of, all of the time signal services were doing that sort of thing, but not synchronized with each other. Uh, and then, of course, they recognized that it would be better if they coordinated these, if they um, all used the same frequencies and jumped at the same time. Uh, and especially after having had the atomic set defined in 1958, this became really feasible. Uh, so they, they agreed on a system where they, they would use uh, frequencies that were uh, frequency offsets that were nice round numbers in atomic terms, uh, and they they would uh, change the frequency only at the end of each year, and they would perform the jumps of 50 milliseconds at a time, uh, and only at the end of the month. Uh, and this is what they did. Started off with the time signals running 50 parts per billion slower than atomic time at the beginning of 1961. Uh, you can see they did one jump of 50 milliseconds, but then after that they decided that was fiddly small, uh, so they increased the size to 100 milliseconds. And they went a few years like this, um, using various frequency offsets. Uh, in 1967 they decided to run a name for this service, they called it Coordinated Universal Time. Uh, they considered it to be a form of universal time because it very closely tracks universal time. Uh, and they call it Coordinated because it coordinates the dates of universal time um, with the, uh, the, the seconds of atomic time. Uh, so, uh, also in 1967, if you remember, that was the, the year that the atomic second was adopted as the SI second. And after that, people said, isn't it a bit silly that we've got two kinds of, kind of atomic second? We've, we've, got the, we've got the SI second, that's the proper standard, but all the time signals are producing this UTC second, which is slightly longer. Uh, and, and so it was agreed that it would be better to drop the frequency offsets entirely and synchronize only by leaps. Uh, and also, if they're going to be relying on leaps that much, it would be better that they be larger and more convenient to map convenient size. So at the end of 1971, they had one irregular jump, as you can see, uh, which, uh, uh, which arranged for UTC to, uh, to get to an integer number of seconds offset through TAI, in fact, uh, to 10 seconds. Uh, and then after that, they, they used precisely the atomic frequency uh, and jumped by whole second only at the end of June or December, with a slight preference for December. Uh, if you look in more detail at the leaps, you can see the, the wisdom of the decision. Although, although those leap sizes are nice round numbers in atomic seconds, they're very nasty in UTC seconds uh, in, in the frequency offset era. Uh, we call that the rubber seconds era. Uh, in, in, in the modern era, with, with just leaps of whole seconds, it's just seconds, whichever way you look at it. Uh, and, and that service runs in, in that form uh, today. Since the end of this table, there have been 15 more leap seconds, uh, and UTC is now exactly 34 seconds behind atomic time. Uh, so, that's what the time signals are doing. Now, what if you actually want universal time, as it was originally defined? What if you want mean solar time? Well, these days, you ask the International Earth Rotation Service. Every week, they mail out something like this, which tells you which way the Earth is facing today. Well, they, this is their measurement from the past week. You can see there are actually three numbers that they're giving you. There's uh, X and Y and this one. Um, X and Y tell you where the pole is today, because the... Um, the, the position of the Earth's rotational axis isn't actually fixed right through the crust. So they track where the pole effectively is relative to its mean position. Uh, and then over here we have, they call this UT1. Since there are now multiple forms of universal time, the, the original form, which is just mean solar time on the prime meridian, uh, is now called UT1. So they track um, the, the time 
that, that, that row three part of the uh, of Earth orientation in the form of the difference between UT1 and UTC. UTC, of course, stands in here for uh, atomic time. It, it differs only by the integer number of seconds which you're expected to know. And they don't just make these measurements, they predict a year ahead. Um, and you can see from the evolution of the third column there uh, that we're probably going to need the next leap second at the end of 2012. We don't yet know whether we're actually going to have one there because that's up to the IRS as well. They, they only announce leap seconds five or six months in advance. Every six months, they mail out a bulletin like this, which says whether there's going to be a leap at the next opportunity. <laughs> so there won't be one at the end of 2011. Uh, they haven't announced anything for June or December 2012. If you want to convert between UTC and TAI more than a year ahead, you're out of luck. Uh, so sometimes you've got to be prepared to deal with more than one time scale at once. And then if you're going to be truly modern, there's another complication. So far, all, all the time scales I've des described that are supposedly measuring physical time, rather than Earth rotation, have, have assumed that time is the same for everyone. But we now know that's not the case. Newcomb didn't know it, but since Einstein, 1905, it's all changed. So, uh, per the theory of relativity, we know that the, the time you physically experience depends on your motion and your altitude. So, um, if, if you want to track physical time, you have to decide whose physical time, or whose proper time, uh, you're, you're going to track. Um, so, if you're, if you're actually just concerned with the Earth, I'm really limiting the problem here, this very tiny portion of time scales, this is the arrangement of time scales you have to deal with. Over on the left here, we've got the physical time. First of all, coordinate time. Geocentric coordinate time, TCG. This is the relativistically correct time that would be ticked by a theoretical ideal clock that is moving with the Earth, but is at infinite altitude. So it's completely outside the Earth's gravity well, so it's not suffering any gravitational time dilation. This is a very important reference point if you're dealing with a satellite of the Earth, including the Moon. Secondly, we've got terrestrial time, TT. This uh, is closely related to geocentric coordinate time. This is relativistically correct time that will be ticked by a theoretical ideal clock located on the Earth at mean sea level. It differs from TCG uh, by a frequency offset of about one part per billion, uh, which is due simply to, to the difference in altitude. In fact, these days, TT is defined in terms of a, a fixed frequency offset from TCG, rather than in terms of mean sea level as a more primitive concept because we, we can now measure time more precisely than we can measure the sea level. Um, then, international atomic time, which started out on its own as a, an independent time scale and it came out of ephemeris time, which isn't on this graph. Um, that's now recognized as a physical realization of terrestrial time. It's attempting to tick in, uh, the same time as TT. Uh, in, in fact, initially, uh, it didn't take account of, of relativity, relativity, and then in the 1970s, it was realized that the clocks contributing to TAI were ticking at a different rate, in part not due to any defect in the clock, but simply because they were at different altitudes. So since 1977, TAI has, has incorporated corrections. All of, the, all of the clocks contributing to it now correct for, uh, for their altitude. Uh, now, over on the right-hand side here, we have Earth rotation. The purest form of Earth rotation time, uh, that's the Earth's rotation relative to distant stars, ignoring, uh, ignoring the sun. Uh, that's called sidereal time, and the modern form of it is called Earth rotation angle, ERA. This is the first time scale to honestly admit that it's not time. Then we have mean solar time, that's a very old concept, now, we now call it UT1, and then um, these, these are of, a, of some practical use if you're trying to predict UT1. Uh, these are, uh, if you, can t you can take those uh, periodic predictable variations in the speed of Earth's rotation and subtract them out from UT1, and that gives you something that's based on Earth rotation but is a slightly more stable time scale, and uh, there are various forms of that. 
And then down at the bottom we have the coordinated form that, that coordinates the days of, of UT1 and, well, previously sometimes it was UT2, uh, against the seconds of TAI. So, a quick lesson out of this, I'll uh, use the right time scale for the job. You have to think about what it is that you're really measuring. What kind of time do you really care about? You have to distinguish between interval time and time of day. Uh, you have to distinguish between angle and time. Uh, and be prepared to use more than one time scale if the job calls for it. Uh, so that, that's uh, all my uh, prepared material that I wanted to say. Uh, almost out of time. Uh, I'll take questions now. Come on, someone must have a question. I had a, a question from a colleague when I previewed this a couple of days ago. He asked, why are all of these initialisms backwards? And uh, that's, it's the French's fault. Um, the, the, a lot of the initialis initialisms are based on the French form of the name, but the initialism is standard regardless of language. Uh, the French get naming rights on these because they invented the metric system, and they, they host a lot of, of the organizations that, that uh, um, that the, the track these things. You saw the uh, International Earth Rotation Services headquartered in Paris, for example. Oh, and uh, I've got a couple of links for you. Uh, those are interesting web pages and uh, a couple of modules that address the small parts of the problem. Yes?
it's, it's an abomination and ought to be abandoned. I, I've, I've got a, a lengthy spiel that I, is rather off topic here. <laughs> I, I, I think the... I, I, I really hate time zones as well. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the first country to ad adopt standard time zones uh, based, on, uh, uh, based on universal time was New Zealand. And they happen to be, have one of the most far advanced time zones in the world. They're plus 12 and a half hours or something. Um, I, I reckon they're a good candidate to be the, the first country to abandon time zones altogether and use UT for everything. Um, they, they, they're near the international dateline, you see. It's quite easy to arrive a day late for a plane if you're crossing the, the Pacific. Uh, so they, they have to deal with this. There's a measurable economic cost to having time zones. And if they just adopt UT, they can call it airline time. Air airlines use UT internally, they show it on the tickets. That New Zealand could adopt airline time in the same way that, that Britain and the United States uh, adopted railway time in, in the 19th century. <laughs> cows, cows don't care about this. And farmers really hate daylight savings time because it, it, screws, it screws that up. Farmers have to get up and, and go to bed and work according to where the sun is. It doesn't matter what a clock says. And if the milk truck starts turning up an hour earlier or, or later for part of the year, that's a big inconvenience. Just... Swatching... Oh, you're picking the good ones here. Um, Swatching to bedtime was uh, a nasty um, publicity stunt. Um, they, they painted a big line on their factory and said it's the local time at this meridian. No, it wasn't. They, they, they picked UT plus one and just used that. And, and the only other thing to, to propose was, was decimal subdivision of the day. And I, I do like decimal subdivisions of the day. Um, that, that, that's fine, but you don't need to stick an hat on, it, on the front of it. And if you're going to pick one time zone for the whole world to use, then it ought to be UT, not UT plus one, and not wherever that factory is. Next. <laughs> How are the atomic clocks synchronized? That's actually uh, an area, uh, a very difficult area of technology. They use a number of technologies and, and those are advancing all the time uh, just as the clocks are. Um, one, one of the main things they do these days is just to watch GPS satellites. GPS has its own very precise time scale. Its clocks don't officially um, uh, contribute to TAI, but they are excellent clocks and they're visible over a large portion of the year. So one, one of the things, the, the multiple laboratories will watch a particular GPS satellite, they, they, can't, they can't abide the differences between the satellites, but they, they'll watch a particular satellite at the same time, uh, they're, they're, they're correct for flight time and so on, uh, and then they say, the GPS uh, clock matched up with my time scale this way, it matched up with your time scale this way, we can subtract out the GPS thing and get um, uh, get a comparison between our clocks. They call that GPS common mode view. Um, some of the newer satellites are actually supporting a more active mechanism where they exchange signals by direction with a satellite. Uh, they call this two-way time and frequency uh, transfer, something like that. Two-way satellite time and frequency transfer. Um, I, I haven't read all the details, but they're still, they're still advancing uh, that technology. Uh, something I'd like to see is the same way we run NTP uh, over the uh, over UDP. Uh, you, you have problems because the, the UDP packets take a variable amount of time to get through all the switching gear. What I'd like to see is NTP migrate downwards in the protocol stack. I'd like to, my computer's Ethernet card to be talking NTP to the switch in my living room, which can then talk to the uh, NTP to my modem, which can talk NTP to my ISP's modem, uh, and we, we, we can get we can get much finer, much, much more precise synchronisation uh, based on knowing that, that the, the data link is the same length in both directions. do it manually. Um, it, it ought to be automated. I, I hate having to manually re-synchronise a watch. So uh, I'm a big fan of the idea of watches 
listening to the radio time, time signals. You can already get domestic clocks that do that. Uh, you, can, you can get watches that do it a, a bit as well. But none of them do a proper job. They don't do anything as sensible as, a, as the empty beat singing algorithm. What they tend to do is, once a day, around midnight, they'll listen to the time signals and then reset their clock. They do it through a time step. They, they, they don't slew it and they don't correct the frequency learning day to day. Um, so they, they, they don't end TV at the same, uh, at the same level of correctness that Microsoft does. Uh, and, and I, that, that's, that's the way it was 10 years ago and it hasn't advanced since then. And I'm very disappointed with that. <laughs> uh, well, we're well into the coffee break time, but I'm, I'm willing to keep answering questions as long as people have got them. Sorry? Pearl 6 and Pearl 6 and I haven't Posit. looked at what Pearl 6 does. POSIX. POSIX. Oh, POSIX. Um, right. POSIX time is... It's, it was originally intended to be a, a, a simple transformation of universal time. It was also intended to be a linear count of seconds. And in the UDC world, you can't have both. Um, so they, the POSIX committee decided that it should remain uh, a, a simple transformation of UTC. Uh, even though at, at the time, no clock, hardly any computers were actually synchronized with the sub-second level. They, they said it should be a simple transformation of UTC. That's the way all the implementations have gone. And as a result, it is not a linear count of seconds. Um, the, the, you, you get a discontinuity around the leap seconds, where you have it, the, num the time number has to jump back by one. Uh, exactly when it jumps back varies between kernels. Um, if you've got a modern kernel that supports NTP, then there's some extra flags it can give you uh, alongside the time number, which let you work out whether, which version of that second you're in. So you can take correctly through, through an second. I, I've, I've, got a, I've got a Perl program that, that displays a, a very correct clock. It, it will show UTC and take correctly through leap seconds. It will also show a genuine linear count of seconds which I used to, to display TAI, because it, as I said, it's silly to have days in there. It, it, atomic time makes most sense purely as a linear count of seconds. So I count seconds since the synchronization point in 1958. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I, quite a lot of my Perl time-based modules were, were written specifically to support that clock, just to have a correct clock on my desktop. <laughs> multiple time scales. Um, it, they really stuffed up designing the, the um, signal in space uh, for, for GPS. Internally, it has a notional time scale, which it, it gives you a count of weeks, and then you've got three bits for the day within the week, and you've got hours, minutes, and seconds within that. And that gives you a notional time scale, which is another days, hours, minutes, seconds time scale, which they synchronized to, UT, uh, to, to UTC at the beginning of at 1980 which is when they, they devised the system. Uh, and then they didn't do the leap seconds. So it's the same thing that's being proposed we should do with UTC now. Uh, and so the result is we've got this thing called GPS time, which is a fixed 19 seconds behind atomic time. Uh, actually, to be even more strictly correct, there is another difference between GPS time and TAO plus an offset, which is that um, uh, GPS time is based specifically on the clocks at the US Naval Observatory. It's their version of time, not international atomic time. But those clocks are steered to match international atomic time. Now, the GPS signal also gives you some parameters to transform GPS time into UTC. And it, 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 it handles leap seconds correctly. It'll, it, it'll actually tell you if there's a leap coming up. It'll tell you when you should change your transformation. So if you actually have a GPS receiver and it's showing you time, which was part of what GPS was designed to do, uh, it, it will almost always be showing you UTC or some offset from it that you've configured. Uh, looks like we've run out of questions. Uh, thank you. That's